All right, let's call a committee of the whole to order. Uh, first, I will well recognize that most members of the committee are present. We are expecting uh, council member remarks to join us uh, shortly. Uh, noting members of the administration are present, members of the public, uh, including members of the ADA task force, uh, as well as council staff. Uh, and with that, I'll move to approve the minutes of our October 30th meeting. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. And with that, our only other agenda item is resolution 2023-51 uh, regarding our ADA self-evaluation and trans transition plan. Um, and I would turn it over to the administration. Director Leininger, are you going to kick things off for us? Uh, good Please go ahead. Good evening, Council President Litton, members of the City Council. Um, first of all, thank you for, for working to get this meeting scheduled at a time that, that works with our consultant, uh, Steve Metzger, uh, who I'll introduce here in a second, uh, is traveling, uh, as you can tell today, uh, throughout the Midwest. So I'm glad Steve was able to join us today and, and give us his insight into the past two years of work. Um, so we'll start there. This is the culmination of, of, of a two-year effort to examine all city facilities, all of our parks, our programs, and our public rights away um, to determine compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, the result of that is, is hundreds of pages of, of, of analysis um, that you saw via email. Also, you saw the, the hard copies uh, shared uh, at a, a number of different locations that, that ultimately establish and prioritize a, a path forward for us to implement, us being the city, to implement uh, various improvements to our, to our infrastructure and to our programs. Uh, in, in total, the, the report and the plan is a little intimidating, uh, when you, especially when you see it it's sitting here on the table. Um, but it's not unusual for a city of our of our size and, and particularly our age. Um, being a fully built out community from from 70 to 90 years ago, um, uh, things with ADA did not exist at that point in time. So we have we have some work to do, and we've been continuing to do work as as we make improvements throughout the city. Um, but as you look at this, it's important to remember that the, the plan is designed to be implemented over over many years, um, with the the priority being the immediate priority being those items that have the um, the greatest impact to the greatest number of people. As you go through that report, you'll see, uh, and Steve will walk us through this here in a little bit, you'll see how there are, high rec there are high priority, medium priority, and low priority recommendations for all of our different facilities and all of our public rights away. Um, we are, we've been working at this for a number of years. We're gonna continue to work at that, that list uh, over the next probably 30 years uh, is really what the plan is designed for. Um, but it's, it's it, at least now we have a, a comprehensive document that, that shares with us all those things. So with that, first of all, I want to thank uh, a few people. First of all, we have a few members from our, our ADA um, task force uh, that are joining us here this evening. Uh, they were instrumental in, in, in helping lead this effort um, to get us to this point today. And then from a staff standpoint, uh, Michelle Nocta, senior planner, and Andy Fleck, uh, assistant uh, law director for the, for the, for the city. Um, we're instrumental in helping shepherd this. And so with that, I'll hand it over to Steve Metzer. Steve is uh, our consultant with DLZ. Um, Steve's got a few slides to walk us through to kind of at a, at a high level, and we can answer any questions from, from that point. Um, but Steve, I'll, 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 I'll hand it to you, and the, the floor is yours. Oh, great, thanks a lot. And uh, uh, Sean kind of stole some of the thunder of my presentation, right. but uh, <laughs> I will be sure to, to go over those things uh, that are important to emphasize a second time. Um, I was asked to put together just a few slides uh, for about a five minute overview of, of this two lo year long process as Sean mentioned, um, which was to evaluate the city's compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So, you know, first I'm gonna present uh, some of the findings and the programs that were reviewed with, with what uh, the recommendations were uh, identified as we went through that process, discuss some of the opportunities that were provided to the public for input um, not only through the ADA task force, but through some of the other uh, avenues that uh, both the Americans with Disabilities Act requires uh, and other things that we put together to try to solicit some additional information. Uh, also discuss very briefly some of the findings, the estimated cost for some of the physical changes that may be needed to come into compliance, uh, which does not include some of the additional costs that are a little bit softer for staff time and other indirect and direct costs. Uh, that are not directly related to building or other facility type of physical improvements. And then last, I'll just go over some of the most important parts of the city's efforts, which will be to implement this plan, as Sean mentioned, over a, a fairly long process. 
uh, and then be available to answer questions and discuss any other or other items of interest to the to the committee. Uh, on the screen, you see all the different facilities that we evaluated over the process. Uh, Dealsy's initial contract was just to evaluate the city facilities, parks, municipal parking lots. Uh, ultimately, uh, we were asked to um, address the right-of-way facilities as part of the bid that we originally submitted and we held our price for that after I think it was over a year, year plus uh, that we held those and that allowed us to then evaluate the pedestrian push buttons on street parking, uh, sidewalks and curb ramps within the public right-of-way. Uh, we also evaluated a wide variety of city programs, uh, things from whether or not you designate an ADA coordinator and have a formal grievance policy and procedure as required by the ADA, uh, as well as some uh, other types of policies and programs that are unique to each department and community that we uh, assist with this type of compliance work. Um, you can see on the right hand side, as well as throughout chapter two of the transition plan, the types of different policies, programs and procedures that were reviewed and um, some of the findings and recommendations within um, the process that we included in the transition plan. Um, throughout the project, um, the ADA does require public outreach during the self-evaluation phase early, um, which is typically done through um, public notices and other means. We utilize an online um, uh, questionnaire and survey that was done which was really not intended to be statistically significant, but meant more to try to solicit some of the higher level barriers that may be perceived out there to city programs and facilities. And I believe it was pretty successful. We got, uh, I think over 104 responses to the um, survey that was online for uh, and active for over a year. We also sent out um, through Michelle's uh, office letters to 51 different regional, state, and local disability advocacy groups during both the self-evaluation phase as well as when the transition plan was available for public review and comment uh, in September, alerting them of the fact that the city was doing this project and then later that the transition plan was available for review and comment. Uh, as is typical, we did not get any uh, responses from any of those disability advocacy groups, but that doesn't mean that they're not interested, nor that they wouldn't be interested in assisting you with your implementation process in the future. Uh, we did make the draft transition plan available for public review and comment at numerous locations uh, throughout the city, including City Hall and Cove Community Center and the two libraries. And then a PDF version was also available online for a two week uh, time period. Um, we also had numerous meetings with the uh, ADA task force and as I understand it, there are some members of the task force there. Um, very good discussion about some of the barriers that were perceived and some of the different things that uh, are ongoing in the city and will continue to be ongoing. Uh, scooters and outdoor dining and some of the things that present unique challenges to the disabled community in particular uh, were uh, very common topics of discussion and I anticipate that that will continue. So um, the um, public involvement is, is expected to continue into the next phase as you go into implementation uh, and how you do that again, there is no real requirement uh, for how that is performed or done just like there wasn't during our project. But suffice it to say that uh, input from the people that are most impacted by the decisions regarding accessibility uh, is vital to ensure that those uh, individuals are included in the thought process and some of the budgeting discussions. Uh, as Sean pointed out, a community your size and your age uh, with many facilities constructed well before the uh, accessibility was even a consideration is going to have a lot of improvements that are required to meet the letter of all of the uh, requirements for the ADA standards and guidance for accessibility. Um, while the numbers are large, I do want to point out that nearly 30 million of the of the 32 million is associated with your public right of way, curb ramps and sidewalks, and that's an ongoing thing that, uh, especially in the Midwest here where we are, um, I'm in Michigan, but as Sean noted, I travel throughout and when we work in the Midwest and areas that have snow and ice and freeze and thaw cycles, 
Um, it's not uncommon for uh, streets and sidewalks and curb ramps and other paved surfaces to require maintenance on a 10 or a 20 year rotating schedule. And it's just very difficult to keep up with that. So um, unfortunately, quite often curb ramps and sidewalks are, are prioritized based on um, age by uh, complaints uh, and whether or not uh, residents are willing to participate in the cost to replace or, or maintain those types of facilities uh, going on. I do want to point out that while uh, there are a large number of things that were non-compliant and all the different types of facilities we, re we reviewed, uh, not a large number of those are significant barriers in the fact that while they are non-compliant in the letter of the law, most of your city facilities, including right-of-way facilities, are highly usable uh, and will continue to be such until they are uh, modified to meet the uh, letter of this requirements for ADA compliance. As uh, Sean mentioned, uh, you know, throughout this entire project, implementation has been taking place and is already underway. Uh, I know that there are a number of curb ramp projects uh, that are, are currently ongoing throughout different areas of Lakewood, uh, as well as dedicated sidewalk projects to fix some of the uh, areas that are most in need of maintenance and repair. Many of the facilities are uh, planned to be or have been altered, and it was kind of a moving target for our inspectors in some ways to uh, keep ahead of planned alterations and in some of these facilities, uh, improvements such as the, the pool at um, at Lakewood Park, uh, you know, we reviewed it prior to uh, all the modifications and um, worked very closely with Michelle to review some of the design plans to ensure that when uh, modifications to different facilities were made that they met the letter of the, um, at least the design met the requirements for the ADA standards for accessible design. Uh, and also stress the importance of staff ensuring during the inspection process that they were constructed according to that design because that's a very common way that we see uh, issues being um, a problem. So the city has been working on that. Um, we also provided city staff with a number of training seminars that were recorded and are available for anyone to review at the city level uh, on both the requirements for design as well as uh, inspectors and plan reviewers, which are two very important areas of the city to ensure that as you move into implementation with your facilities, that they are designed and constructed according to the requirements of the various codes that are that are out there. So um, it is really vital that the city uh, continue to document all your ADA compliance efforts. And I know I've said that enough times over the past couple of years that uh, Michelle Nocta and some of the other uh, staff members that we've interacted with as well as the task force are well aware of documenting it to not only ensure that you are um, able to demonstrate what improvements you have been made, making and have made and are planned to be made, but also to protect the city in the case that you are uh, audited by the Department of Justice or whatnot. Uh, you have a very good documentation and record of your compliance efforts and that will go a long ways um, in, in that investigation. So while you do have a nice new transition plan that's very comprehensive, it uh, really does need to be considered a living document. Uh, it really needs to be updated uh, as needed. Uh, depending on who you talk to, they recommend uh, updates on a three to five year rotating basis depending on uh, what changes go on right now there's a lot of things within the ADA uh, and accessibility community related to technology and some of the changes in technology I mean who would have thought three years ago when we started this project that we would be doing zoom meetings for these types of things and for task forces uh, because uh, well, we all started with COVID so uh, technology is changing requirements for standards the right-of-way standards which were previously a guideline are very close to being a uh, enforceable standard. Um, and there are some changes to the uh, guidelines even uh, as they move towards that standard. So um, the transition plan does need to be updated, maintained and keep your project list of achievements and, and plans. Uh, it is a planning level document. Uh, so ensure that you have annual lists of accomplishments and, and all the different budgets for your or ADA projects as you move forward and somehow figure out how you're going to include that uh, important component of the disabled community in some of those decision-making processes. 
So that's a, about a five or six minute review, maybe a little longer. I lose track of time. People know I'm not short on uh, words uh, when it comes to NBA, but uh, that's a brief overview of our two year project and a 700 and some odd page document. So I'm available for questions now, as well as uh, any time in the future as uh, city staff is, is very well aware. Thank you. I'm sure um, my colleagues as well myself uh, have some questions, uh, curiosities, et cetera. Um, I personally dive right into budget type questions, um, particularly where there's already existing overlap. Uh, it's talked about in this presentation how there are things already underway. I acknowledge that we're, uh, I think, nicely and coincidentally at year 10 of a 10 year sidewalk uh, improvement program. Um, and thus perhaps able to look at how we approach sidewalks differently, perhaps with this ADA um, task force work in mind. Um, and I'm curious of if there are budget, uh, if we are comp com contemplating utilizing um, side the sidewalk program to essentially attack the needs and wants of the uh, transition plan. Council President Litton, the sidewalk program is, is one of, of many ways that we, we work to, to address these issues. Um, that helps take care of the frontage in front of people's homes. Um, we have separate programs then where we are looking at the, the ramps and the crossings um, leading to and from across the street. Um, we, a lot of times, historically, we've done that just simply through, through street resurfacing pro projects uh, when, we, when we address those items. Um, this year, uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, we have uh, we did set aside money in this year's budget to to address some of those handicap ramps or eight, uh, accessible ramps through the community. I think we did 96, 90 something, uh, over 90 this year. Um, so continue to add funding, and you'll see that reflected in the in the budget that's about to be proposed to 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 you all. Um, that has both project specific items, including the sidewalk program, including then street programs. We sometimes get tied into water line and sewer projects, as long as then specific line items for ADA improvements within the public right away um, to, to address these things. Um, and then as we're, we're this, uh, another example within uh, this project right now, or within this building right now, is the use of our ARPA funds to help address the, the elevators uh, in this building. We're fortunate we have two separate elevators, but um, uh, both of them are old. Um, not necessarily compliant with 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 current um, current standards, so we're working to get the, these elevators replaced and up to up to snuff. I'll hold off on more sidewalk related questions for now. Uh, colleagues, do you have any questions, Councilman Bullock? <clears throat> thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, uh, Director Leininger and uh, our expert presenter, uh, Mr. Metzer, via the cloud, and to the ADA task force members who are here. Um, so I welcome all of the recommendations and a lot of good hard work, I know, by my colleagues, especially Councilwoman Keppel. Um, so uh, a couple questions. One is, um, cr uh, forgive me if this has been stated before, but so I'm clear, this is not a nice to have, this is a must have re required by federal law, if I understand. So um, there's a significant price tag involved, so we're going to have to, um, pay due attention in our budget for the next five years, and really it's going to be for, for an ongoing forever um, uh, to, to make sure we're in compliance. So could somebody speak to maybe the law director, you know, what's, you know, how much leeway does the city have? It sounds like we're already behind um, uh, in terms of our compliance schedule. That's, that's part of the question. The other thing I'd love to know, what proportion of work is private versus public? It's, it, it's easier for the city decision makers to control city decisions, but a good amount of this is going to be a, you know, private property owners, right? Uh, and then the final thing is cost effectiveness versus the cost. I know in our sewer plan, for example, we, we talk about how you spend a million dollars and you're going to have to spend many millions of dollars uh, on both plans. But we want to have a weather eye towards which is the first million to spend to have the most net positive impact on the outcomes. So, for example, that I, I did appreciate the price tag. There's a slide. I, I don't know if we can rewind to it with the, the breakout by categories. And the lion's share was for sidewalks, 
uh, which is something the city can directly have uh, some, some say over. Um, but is that going to have the most net value to ADA access and, and accessibility? Do we have any metric by which we can evaluate that? Maybe the answer is no, but I'd certainly love to, to be a student on that front. You know, what's most important? Is it, is it the curb ramp or is it something else? And I'll stop there. Thanks. So I'll start, Steve, and then I'll, I'll, I'll hand probably the compliance issue over to you, and then maybe you can walk through um, kind of the methodology in determining the highest, high, medium, and low priorities. Um, as, as far as your, your middle question, uh, Councilman Bullock, um, public versus private, all of this plan deals with the public realm, everything that the city is, is in control of. Yes, there's a, there's a whole other world of, of private improvements, private businesses, private enterprise that, that has their own regulations that they have to, to, to comply with. And, and we do manage that as, as things come in for permit, depending on what the type of permit is, there's certain tr thresholds that get triggered that, that then may or may not require certain levels of ADA compliance. So I guess that's kind of the stick. Now there's, 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 there might be ways, and we've had conversations internally about how can we utilize some of our, our, our storefront dollars, our CDBG um, commercial revitalization program funding to help when someone's coming into us for storefront dollar or for to make renovations to their building, how can we help invest in some of those improvements that they might not otherwise be able or want to, to invest in, um, to give a little bit of a carrot in, in that regard. Um, as far then as it, as it relates to compliance um, and, and when are we found to not be compliant um, versus um, following this plan and, and being in compliance, I don't know, Steve, to put you on the spot a little bit with that question then. Um, as far as the methodology of the greatest, the greatest bang for our buck in setting up the high, uh, high, medium, and low um, priorities for for implementation. Okay, so there's a, a, a couple of, of things there. Um, for, I'll, I'll I'll address the second one first, Sean. Okay. Which is the prioritization. Um, in the prioritization of both the facilities and the areas within or at each of those facilities um, that needs to be given the highest priority, we looked at a number of different factors. And it, it is very subjective. And uh, from uh, the consultant side, we don't always know all the things that go on and all the facilities. Um, Mr. Metzger, would you, plans could I interject, be, sir? Could you yeah. put up the slide that shows the prioritization breakout in the different categories, the high, medium, yeah. low, that, that would be helpful. Sorry to interrupt your 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 description. Yeah, there's a slide. Hold on a second. I got to I got to share my screen again. I think I still can. Did you take that away? Oh, there it is. Sorry. Nope. Should still have it. Yep, I do have it. Apologies, we, we're just trying to make keep you on your ask toes. A similar question. It's it's fine. Not a problem. I got it. Can you see it now? Yes, we have it, Steve. Okay. All right. So, in the development of the low, medium, and high priorities for each one of those different groups of facility types, there are a number of factors that come into play. Um, for example, for your buildings and parking lots. Um, we have prioritized each individual non-compliant item as a low, medium, or high priority. And that's what's reflected within this table. We've done the same thing for every amenity at parks um, for 170 miles of sidewalk by block, um, keeping in mind that an entire block is designated as one type of priority because you're probably going to repair those sidewalks on a block by block based basis as part of a street project or a water project or other type of utility project or a standalone safe routes to schools project or something like that. But there's another factor that comes into play when looking at um, the prioritization and that is particularly for your buildings and parks is which ones are your highest public use facilities. 
So for example, you may have within your uh, water, wastewater treatment plant, some high priority items that to a wastewater employee would be a fairly significant barrier to them using a drinking fountain or getting into a door or getting into a restroom. But since your wastewater treatment plant is not a high public use facility, the prioritization that you would give that specific item in the wastewater treatment plant, unless you know of an employee that specifically needs that accommodation through your Title I ADA access, which is a whole other avenue of ADA compliance, you are not likely going to be spending a lot of money at your police station, at your wastewater treatment plant, at some of those low public use facilities. Rather, you're going to be spending the money at your highest public use facilities, City Hall, Municipal Court, the City Annex, Lakewood Park, some of your other very high use parks that have very unique facilities. Um, the other item that comes into consideration whether or not we deem a specific amenity to be a low, medium, or high priority is how large of a barrier does it present to an individual with a, an impacted disability. So for example, um, if you really are bored and take a look at every one of the line items in the Appendix A, which is your buildings and parks, you'll see a number of things like light switches that might be a half inch too high, a door that might be a, a half an inch too narrow, um, and, and similar types of things. Those are typically going to be low priority because A, they have very little impact on most users, disabled or not, in their ability to utilize them. Um, secondly, they only deviate from the requirement by a very, very small amount. However, quite oftentimes when you go into a building and you do a renovation, you're going to renovate the entire space like a restroom. So while a light switch in a restroom may be a low priority because it's an inch high, when you go in and alter that restroom, you're going to fix everything in the restroom. You're not going to just cherry pick all the high priority items. Some of the more significant barriers at your facilities and parks would be things like restroom doors that are 28 inches when they're required to be 32 and someone in a wheelchair cannot get in the restroom. Um, a restroom that does not have a stall that is sized adequately for a wheelchair user to get into the stall, maneuver to the toilet, use the grab bars to offload onto the toilet, use the facilities and be able to get back out those are some of the higher priority specific items that we feel need to be addressed. And we've discussed many of those in great detail with both staff and um, at, the, at task force meetings. So I think the staff has a very good understanding and knowledge of how we prioritize not only the facilities, but every specific non-compliant item within or at those facilities. And, it, and it's gonna be a planning process. Um, you know, you've already done some improvements at, at Lakewood Park at the pool that I think made a great improvement. But there's definitely more. And I know we had discussions about the concession stand restroom, which is a very high centralized location at Lakewood Park that the doors are just too narrow for a wheelchair to get into and is essentially unusable. So those are the types of high priority items at a high priority location that we feel need to be the highest priority. And we didn't go through and again, cherry pick and say, all these things need to be in your first five years because there are so many more moving parts to a CIP. And this is essentially a CIP um, for accessibility, but it's not only for accessibility other types of building improvements or other types of park improvements can all utilize some funding sources that would be available and not specifically identified for accessibility to make accessibility improvements while you're doing other things. I mentioned safe routes to schools. Safe routes to schools typically are not specifically 
to address accessibility issues, but more connectivity. And as part of those connectivities between neighborhoods and schools, you can make curb ramp improvements, you can make sidewalk improvements through various funding sources that address not only safety for children that are walking to school, but also the compliance with ADA that may not be present on all of those routes. So hopefully that answers those questions. And did I, is there one other one that I didn't answer? I think you're good, Steve. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Rader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, thank you for taking the time out. This is great. And thank you to our, our residents who serve in this commission. And, and this is a, a lot of tons of great information. Um, and, and just to kind of follow on some of these questions about how decisions are made, that's very helpful. Thank you for that insight. I want to kind of like take it to the next phase here. What, yeah, how will these be notated in our upcoming budget in terms of like how will they be called out so council could kind of digest uh, in real time how these changes are being made or, 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 or when these things are happening, how are we going to know about them, how are we going to track them, and how, this track, how, how are those changes going to be communicated in a way so we can follow up on it, keep tabs on it, make sure that the plan is sort of being um, utilized and implemented as, as it's been laid out. This is a fantastic amount of information, um, and I have absolutely no doubt the administration's already working very hard to integrate it into our planning next year, but how are we going to see it manifest in our budget? How do we hold sort of uh, I won't say accountable, how do we go through that process of, of, you know, knowing what's in there, knowing what's left, how far we've come next year, that kind of stuff. So in, in terms of how things will be reflected in the budget, um, many of the, because this is part of an overall CIP, as Steve mentioned, a lot of this is going to be just part of how we do business, as, as it has been for some time. So when we have a facility project or a park project or, or a road project, it's going to be baked into that, that, that project overall. The thing that you'll, you'll see a little bit different, I don't have the, the draft of the CIP in, in front of me, is you may see some individual line items for things that are just AD improvements, like we mentioned the, the public right-of-way improvements for, for curb ramps. Um, you may see some of those individual items or, or line items that are specific to ADA. As, as far as how we track that, uh, Michelle actually serves as our, as our ADA coordinator, and so she will be the one that's working with Public Works and our other departments to make sure that is probably at the end of the year just to kind of do a, a, a sum up of, hey, this is, this is what we said we were going to do, what do we do, um, and then really update this, this document to, to make it a living document in the sense that we can start to now move some things off of the list. Also, when we go into the planning process for, for next year's budget and for CIP, start identifying, okay, we're going to be doing this project. What did this say, and, and how do we address that? So that's, that's how you'll see it tracked over time and implemented over time. Council Member Baker. Uh, th thank you, um, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you. Uh, to the administration and the volunteers who served on the task force. Um, this is a tremendous amount of work. I went through a similar thing at Metro Parks. Uh, we did our ADA transition plan a couple years ago. And it's not only identification, uh, which we've clearly done here, and this is a very detailed report. Um, I think it will be a guidepost. Uh, but it's like consistency and following through, and it sounds like we're setting ourselves up to do that. Uh, the, the, the one thing that I'm curious if we can talk a little bit more about, we've talked a lot about the built environment some of the priorities, how we prioritize them, is getting into like staff training and, um, and kind of the culture side of it, right? So um, as I think about it, you know, at Metro Parks, we literally, a lot of us got in the field, um, went to what would be an accessible parking spot, took that clear path to where the restroom was, to where the facilities were, understood clearances, gaps to make sure, because a lot of this is maintenance, right? It's uh, making sure that you know, uh, the, the lip isn't too high so that someone with a mobility device can get over it, uh, that when you get in the bathroom, the grab bars are a proper height, the sinks are a proper height, that, you know, you have the right kind of faucets so that they don't require a ton of power to, to, to turn on, uh, things like that. So can you kind of explain some of the things that we've set up from a culture standpoint to help with our employees to get there uh, to, to kind of take us to the next level? So throughout this process, We've, we actually, as part, as, as part of this transition plan, we, as, uh, the contract with DLZ, uh, there was a series of, of, of staff trainings that were, that were held 
uh, on various topics. Um, we've also then incorporated, we use this, uh, is it NeoGov? Is that the name of the system? Uh, we use a NeoGov for, uh, system for, through HR for a lot of our, our training throughout the city. Um, we have incorporated now ADA accessibility and ADA uh, training um, within that, that training module that all existing employees have received and all new employees will receive as, as they are onboarded here uh, um, uh, with city employment. Moving forward then, uh, we need to continue as to, to incorporate those trainings each year um, so that we start to understand and, and do those site visits and do those walkthroughs um, for, for those physical barriers, but then also with, with our programmatic barriers and, and trying to understand when someone comes and wants to review a, a plan like this. Do we have, do we have it in the right format, the right font size, the right, those types of things. So we're not, we're, we're thinking about this um, 24 seven and from a 360 degree perspective. Um, we're, we're getting started. Uh, that's something we need to continue to develop, develop over time. Uh, thank you. And, and what, you know, c customer service is the thing that comes to mind and it sounds like that's the approach we're taking with it. And um, I think that goes a long way and meeting people, you know, to kind of understand their needs and, and ways in which we can address it. So thank you. Would any uh, members of the task force like to speak to findings, uh, opinions, ideas, uh, et cetera? And name and address for the record, if you don't mind. Anna Thank Greenlight. you. Yes. Tracy Greenberg, 1423 Lauderdale Avenue. I am the co-chair of the ADA Transition Plan Task Force, and I'm very happy about this moment. Uh, a couple things were mentioned that I just wanted to say. Um, we talked about grievances. And a grievance is what they call it when a person with a disability encounters a barrier and they're brave enough to come forward about it. I don't know what percentage of people that encounter barriers come forward with a grievance. This transition plan eliminates the need for a squeaky wheel to make awareness of a barrier. And as disabled people, as a person with a disability, I find it my job to make awareness of barriers. And I hope that there comes a day where it's not my job. And it, a transition plan that we have here, there was a huge investment. It took 30, it will take 30 years to fully implement it. We won't, none of us will be sitting in this room. This room might not even be here. So another mention was of accountability. What we really need is we need an ongoing accessibility commission to run in tandem with this transition plan to work with our ADA coordinator and our planning department to make sure that the accountability is definitely in place. And thank you everybody for, first of all, the hard work on this. Thank you to Steve. Thank you to our planning and development department, the mayor, um, everybody, the law director, and our our task force that did this hard work over two years. So thank you very much. We're looking forward to the day that you adopt it at the next council meeting, hopefully, and we appreciate you. Thank you. Hi again. Ami Young of Victoria Avenue, co-chair of the ADA task force, though seriously, this was Tracy's baby. Tracy did so much of the work to make this happen and uh, deserves all of the applause. Um, simple things that cost nothing that we are missing or that cost very little that we are missing. One thing, I just saw some on the screen that somebody enabled transcripts, but the closed captions aren't showing. I've been sitting over here going, mm, I guess I'll watch the Zoom later. Or I'll watch the recording later and with the captions on to catch what was said there because I missed it. Uh, my physical disability is obvious, but I am also hard of hearing. And yeah, sign language is lovely. I am fluent in sign, but only a tiny more, uh, percentage of people with hearing difficulties are fluent in sign. Captions help 
more than just audio issues. It also helps people who have attention issues or if you get distracted for a minute and miss something or some noise happens, it helps everybody. So I would love to see our meetings, our public meetings constantly, just turn on the Zoom ca captions. If you've got Zoom running and you're projecting it, click on the captions. Problem solved, didn't cost anything, don't have to have anybody doing anything. Um, there's also the irony of I was running a little late to get here and I had to park in a standard parking spot because we have insufficient ADA parking at City Hall. And that's a bit of a problem that I think we could possibly solve with some signs and some paint for very low price. This is a problem around the town. Um, it is very hard. You're asking what priorities. Uh, I saw that a high priority is a, a low cost is parking. And that was included in the parking. There are so many places in this city where just moving, making a, another ADA compliant spot by just putting one on the other side of the hash marks that already are there, or moving an ADA spot to a better location so that people with mobility challenges can get onto the sidewalk. I was at Lakewood Main Library today where they, uh, after my pushing for a while, they added three signs that say reserved for limited mobility. If it hadn't been for those parking spaces, I wouldn't have been able to get my sons to go tutor their schoolmates today. I wouldn't have been able to get out of my vehicle to go make sure that that, ha that connection happened. These are the life situations where it's invisible. If it doesn't, it, if it doesn't matter, if it doesn't affect you personally, it's really easy to let it fall into your oblivious spot. You need, just like we as citizens need to be able to delegate attention to so many of these minutia to you as our elected officials, we need you to delegate the attention to some of the, to these disability issues to people that are impacted by it. Find people like you did with this task force that you can trust to go check the issue and report back to you with a vetted, validated perspective that you know that they're not just being cranks. Because, you know, yeah, I can be cranky sometimes. So that, it's not all on the bravery of our disabled citizens who are afraid of what will happen if, you, if they catch you in a not so charitable mood. We need to be able to trust that our voices will be heard and finding how to report the issues, putting more public visibility, or public, public perceivability in how to report the issues in more places would also go a long way to making sure that there is citizen involvement in making progress and we aren't expecting it to go from where we are now to perfect in a year. Just showing that we're making constant progress and that we're all a part of this process. That's what we need to be doing and that's what I am so joyful that I know I can trust this, this entire city government to do. This has been a real joy in my life to be a part of this process. And I look forward to boosting more people into engaging as experts in disability from lived experience. Thank you. Any uh, further comment from my colleagues or questions? Oh, good. Please come forward. Hi, my name is Chris Cowan. I live at 13231 Merle Avenue, and I was also a part of the task force. Um, by profession, I'm an occupational therapist, so my job is um, to ensure that um, everyone I work with gets to be as independent and to do the things that mean the most to them and whatever their personal goals are. And I, I'm really happy that I got to be a part of this. Um, this task force, and uh, I got, and I really love the city that I live in, and I'd like to be able to see that everyone can participate in the things that they love and that they want to enjoy in Lakewood, Ohio. You know, the parks, you know, coming to City Hall to vote, to do whatever it is they need to do, um, and it was really a joy. And I um, want to thank you for this opportunity to work with this task force. Thank you. Thank you, and and I, I, I just want the members of the task force that are present and any others who are uh, perhaps viewing elsewhere, um, I, I want you to know that, that this work does not fall on, on, on deaf ears, pardon the expression. Um, 
that I, I believe we have a council and an administration committed to doing everything we can to implement um, every level of priority in the plan, but to, to prioritize wisely, to budget wisely, um, and with all of your work in mind as we go forward. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all of your hard work. Uh, we appreciate it. Any other comments, colleagues? Vice President Couple. Thank you. Um, I'll just say briefly, I've um, had the privilege of being the council liaison to the ADA Transition Plan Task Force and um, really appreciate all the work of the task force members of uh, Michelle Nocta and Andrew Fleck um, being involved with that too. It's been a lot of work and um, Steve's led us bravely through all this intense documentation and uh, we have a lot of work in front of us, but I am grateful for the expertise and uh, time of our citizens who have donated their time and talents um, to help us do the best we can for them. And uh, I'm looking forward to how we move forward on this together. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comment, colleagues? Or questions? Director Langer and the administration, anything else to add? Nothing further. Okay. Um, thank you to Mr. Metzer for joining us virtually as well. I appreciated your uh, commentary. I think it helped inform our discussion this evening and I'm glad we can make that all work out. Um, with that, I will uh, move to recommend adoption. Second. Motion's been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And that motion passes. And with that, Committee of the Whole is adjourned.